Welkom bij inmiddels alweer de zevende lezing van de Sidi Informatiereeks Israël en het Midden-Oosten. Van 13 januari tot en met 24 maart organiseert Sidi elke woensdagochtend om 10 uur uh, een lezing. Heeft u de eerdere lezingen van de Informatiereeks uh, gemist of wilt u die gewoon terugkijken? Dat kan op de verschillende Sidi-kanalen, waaronder op YouTube. Uh, dat kunt u vinden op Sidi.tv. Op de website van CIDI kunt u ook de rest van het programma vinden. Dan uh, zou ik graag ook de, deel, uh, de mensen die kijken ook graag willen wijzen. Het is verkiezingstijd, uh, zowel in Nederland als in Israël. In Nederland zullen we op 9 maart een online Midden-Oosten verkiezingsdebat uh, organiseren met de zes grootste partijen in de peilingen. Uh, Vanwege de avondklok zal dat iets eerder plaatsvinden uh, om half zeven. En vanwege de coronamaatregelen uh, is er helaas geen fysiek publiek mogelijk. Maar u kunt dan meekijken uh, via de uh, Nieuwsport website. En, en ook natuurlijk via de CD kanalen dat belooft, Het belooft een pittig debat te worden met de zes grootste Nederlandse partijen in de peilingen. Over verschillende onderwerpen over het Midden-Oosten. En is wel in het bijzonder natuurlijk. And now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Today we have uh, Dr. Ralph Sims from the Institute of National Security Studies. And he will be telling us about Iran and Israel. Uh, Dr. Sims, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Siri, for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, it's been uh, almost three years, I think, uh, since I visited uh, the Netherlands, uh, invited by Siri and the Israeli embassy and gave some briefings and had some very interesting meetings with the members of Siri when it was still uh, possible to do that uh, before COVID. And I really hope that uh, we will be able to meet in person uh, soon enough. Uh, I was asked to share my thoughts and my observations concerning uh, the relationship uh, developments between Israel and Iran. Uh, I have to tell you that usually when I speak, when I talk to Israelis, they want to get uh, the Iranian perspective. When I talk to uh, foreign diplomats, for example, they usually ask me to focus on, uh, on the Israeli perspective. So you are uh, some, some, uh, somehow in, in between. So I will try to, uh, to do both, uh, share my thoughts both about the Iranian perspectives and their opinions and their positions, but also the Israeli ones. Uh, just, uh, just a reminder, I, I do not represent in any way the, Israeli, the, the, the official position of the state of Israel or the Israeli government. So uh, I barely represent myself these days. So please uh, remi uh, remember that. Uh, let me start uh, with a little story. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you are aware of, uh, of the Iranian judoka, uh, Saeed Molai, uh, who last week visited Israel for the first time. Molai, if you don't know his story, this is a very interesting story. He's a famous uh, Iranian judoka, uh, a world champion, uh, who back in 2019 was banned by the Iranian authorities to compete against uh, the Israeli judoka Saeed uh, Sagimuki. And following this uh, event in Tokyo, uh, he decided to, to leave Iran uh, to go to exile, he went to Germany, and now he uh, competes under the Mongolian uh, flag. And he visited Israel uh, a week ago, competed for the first time uh, against Israeli uh, athletes. But I have uh, my, my own personal story about, about him. Uh, about uh, two and a half years ago, uh, I received a phone call from uh, one of my colleagues in Israel, a friend of mine, uh, who used to be uh, one of the managers of uh, the Israeli judoka Sagimuki. And he told me, and he was very excited, he told me, look, we, we just received a letter 
from the World Judo Federation, uh, saying that the Iranian government has announced and has uh, made us uh, re, uh, has, has, has told us that uh, we, we will not continue the policy of boycotting Israeli athletes uh, who want to, to who have to meet and compete against uh, Iranians. And that was very important because uh, the meaning of that for Sagim Muki was that he might be uh, able to compete against Saeed Molaid, the Iranian judoka. So he asked me, my friend, uh, what do you think about it? And I told him very, very clearly, no chance. There is no chance that the Iranian government, despite everything it wrote to the World Federation, will let the, Isra the, the Iranian athletes to compete against the Israeli ones. And he asked me, how can you be so sure? And I told him because uh, I follow the Iranian media and uh, every few months I can see a meeting taking place between the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, who meets Iranian uh, players, Iranian athletes, Iranian uh, chess mates, players uh, who refused to compete against Israeli athletes and he praises them and he says, we will never change our policy of boycotting Israeli athletes because this will be a recognition of the state of Israel and we will never allow it. And unfortunately, I was right. When it came, uh, when Moulaï arrived in Tokyo, uh, he, he was under much pressure from the Iranian authorities and not to compete against the Israeli one and he, and he had to leave. And the question, of course, is why are the Iranians, or I would say the Iranian regime, so obsessed with Israel? And I have to tell you that uh, if you follow Iranian media in the last few years, and I, I, I'm taking just this incident, or just, that, just this issue of uh, boycotting Israeli athletes, there are voices, more and more voices in Iran, including in Iranian press, saying we should not do that. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't make any sense when you see Palestinians and Egyptians and, uh, and Arab uh, athletes ready to compete against Israel. We should not boycott Israeli athletes. We should not recognize the state of Israel, but we should not boycott Israeli athletes. So why is this obsession uh, uh, from Khamenei, from the Iranian regime concerning Israel? And usually when uh, people ask why, uh, uh, why are the Iranians uh, so obsessed with Israel, the, the, the immediate answer is uh, due to ideological reasons. And yes, the ideological reason has played a major role in Iran's policy towards Israel. Uh, you don't have to read the statements of Khamenei alone, and you don't have to read the speeches of the current leaders of Iran. Even if you go back to the 1950s and 60s and 70s and read the books and the statements of Khomeini, for example, the leader of the Islamic Revolution, you can see the level of obsession he had with the existence of the state of Israel. Now, the, the Iranian official ideology since the revolution has been we have nothing to do, we have nothing against the Jews. The Jews can live. There is, a, as you probably know, a Jewish community, something between 8,000 to 15,000 Iranian Jews still living in Iran. They can live their, their, their life according to their, their, their religion. They, they even have their own representative in the Iranian parliament, in the Iranian majlis. So the regime said we have nothing, nothing against the Jews. But Jews are not people. They are a religion. And as a religion, they do not deserve the right for self-determination. And this is the Iranian official ideology. And if you write, if, again, if you read the statements and if you read the, uh, the ideology of the Iranian clerics, they would say that the, the existence of a Zionist state in the Middle East is uh, a result of a Western conspiracy to weaken the Islamic world. Some of them even say that it was meant to uh, delay the uh, reappearance of the so-called hidden imam, the imam, the, the Shia imam, the Messiah. Where, uh, and as long as Israel exists, uh, uh, the, the, the Messiah will not return, the imam will not return. So this is something uh, very important in the ideology of the Islamic Republic. 
But, and this is a very important but, I do not think as an, 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 an analyst of Iran that we can understand everything about Iran only through the ideological uh, uh, perspective. And why? Because is Iran, uh, and I know that some people, including Israel, uh, think otherwise. But I have to tell you, Iran is a rational state. It is not moderate, but it is rational. And whenever Iran had to choose between ideology and national interest, it usually preferred the national interest over its ideology. So I think we have to look at something else. And I, uh, let me give you an example. We, Israel, are considered by Iran as the little Satan, but there is a bigger Satan. And the, the, the great Satan is, is, of course, the United States. And the, the, the hostility, the Iranian hostility towards the United States was also part, a very important part, of the Iranian uh, uh, ideology. I, I remember back in 2001, under the presidency of, uh, of President Mohammad Khatami in Iran. He was the most moderate president of Iran since the Islamic Revolution. And I remember he was in favor of a dialogue between Iran and the United States, but he didn't, uh, he, was, he was unsuccessful to, uh, to convince Khamenei, uh, the supreme leader, to change his policy against any kind of a dialogue with the United States. So what he did in 2001 was to carry out uh, a survey, a public survey, uh, and he, uh, in order to check what are, the, uh, what are the opinions within Iranian society towards the possibility of a dialogue with the United States. He might have thought that if he, go, if he approaches Khamenei with results saying that most of the Iranians want a dialogue with the United States, he might ch change his mind. So there was a survey carried out by uh, an Iranian uh, um, surveys uh, organization and it turned out that the majority of the Iranians support a dialogue with the United States. The next day after the results were published, the organization was, uh, was banned. They arrested the manager of this organization. And since then, nobody was, uh, was able to speak about the dialogue with, uh, with the United States. But here you can see that Iran, and when I'm speaking about Iran, I'm speaking about the Supreme Leader Khamenei, uh, he changed his mind. And a few years ago, when Khamenei understood that it was uh, essential for Iran to remove the economic sanctions, the economic international sanctions, he gave the permission, he gave the authority to President Rouhani and to uh, Foreign Minister Zarif to uh, hold talks with uh, Kerry, with the United States. And yes, he told them um, the United States should not be trusted. And you can only talk about the nuclear issue with the United States. But the result was that for the first time, Iran and the United States were engaged in a direct dialogue between them. So this is uh, uh, a, a, a perhaps a, 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 an evidence that when Iran wants to change its ideology, it can do that. But when it comes to Israel, nothing has changed. Uh, and the reason for that is that this is not just ideology. And when you look at the national interests of Iran, Iran, especially I would say in the last two or three decades, has considered Israel not just as a revolutionary ideological problem, but also as a threat to its national interest, a threat to its national security. And Israel is certainly considered as, uh, as a strategic rival, uh, both with, consider, con uh, with regard to the Israeli threat on the nuclear activity of Iran, and I'll get uh, and, and I refer to that uh, later, and to Iranian other interests. So I would say that this is not just a matter of ideology; it's a matter of a way for Iran to preserve what it considers to be national interests. And unfortunately, its hostility towards Israel uh, is a, uh, has uh, they don't have to to pay. Uh, a big price for that, uh, because actually they can use their hostility towards Israel as a, uh, as a way to mobilize support in the Muslim world and even in the Arab world. Despite all the developments of recent years, it's still very efficient to uh, call for the destruction of the state of Israel and mobilize some uh, popular support in the, uh, in the Arab and in the, in the Muslim world. So I, I would say that 
Iran's hostility towards Israel is perhaps one of the only issues Iran has not changed its uh, position towards since the Islamic Revolution. And whenever I'm asked, do you think there is a chance of uh, Iran changing its policy? My personal opinion is that at least until Khamenei is there, nothing will change because uh, Khamenei uses Israel perhaps as the only flag he can still use to, uh, to, to say we are still committed to the ideology and to the principles of the Islamic revolution. There are no, there are, he can no longer use the, the flag of the anti-Americans, uh, the anti-American flags, because as I said before, uh, Iran is engaged or was engaged in dialogue with the United States. He can no longer use the flag of exporting the revolution because Iran does not export the revolution as it used to be, as it used to do under, uh, after the revolution. So the only flag they can use to say we are still committed to the Islamic revolution is the anti-Israeli flag and they don't have to pay uh, uh, a price for that. Um, that's the reason why if you go to Tehran, uh, you will see a big di di digital uh, countdown placed in, in Tehran where you can see, where you can follow the number of days left until Israel is going to disappear. Because back in 2015, in a speech uh, by Khamenei, he said that Israel will disappear, will not uh, survive the next 25 years. So we still have, I think, 19 years until this, uh, this happens. But, uh, uh, but th there's something very interesting because whenever uh, Iran and whenever the Iranian officials are speaking about uh, Israel, which has uh, to disappear from the map of geography or to be wiped out of the map, they always use the passive tense. It's not, they are never, they, they never say Iran has to do that. Iran has to annihilate Israel. It's all, it's always in the passive tense. Israel has to be disappeared somehow. We, of course, will, we will help, will give assistance to anyone who wants to do that. But it's not our responsibility to do that. Our only responsibility is to help uh, whoever wants to carry out this uh, strategic mission of, uh, uh, of annihilating uh, Israel. So this, this is an, in, in a very brief, uh, as a, as a very brief introduction to the uh, reasons or the ideology behind their uh, hostility and enmity uh, towards Israel. But what I want to do now is to be uh, to concentrate on what is called in Israel, not just in Israel, as the Iranian threat. What is the meaning of the Iranian threat, and what are the, the uh, what are the uh, the different parts of this uh, so-called threat? Well, first of all, I have to say that there is no one single Iranian threat. Uh, usually, when we speak in Israel about the Iranian threat, uh, we consider three major and different threats. Some of them are more immediate threats. Some of them are more important threats. But there are three main threats, and I will. Uh, I, I, would not, I, I would like to uh, address each and, and, and every one of them. The first, and I think the biggest threat, although this is not an immediate threat, uh, this is the nuclear threat, the nuclear uh, program uh, of Iran. Now, I, I would like to say a few words about Iran's nuclear activity and about Iran's nuclear uh, program. One of the, of the mistakes one of the misconceptions, including in Israel, is that Iran decided to have this, uh, its nuclear program or to renew its nuclear program because the nuclear program uh, uh, was, initiate, was initiated by the Shah, by the Shah of Iran in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and then after the revolution, it was actually uh, seized. It was delayed for, for a few years because Khomeini and the Islamic regime said that uh, this was part of the megalomanian uh, programs of the, of the Shah, and there is no reason why Iran should, uh, uh, should continue its nuclear program. But then in the second half of the 1980s, Iran renewed its nuclear program. And some Israelis uh, are confident that the reason for that was Israel. Why, usually when I ask uh, my audience, why do you think Iran wants a nuclear weapon? Why, why, why does it want a nuclear program? Uh, the most common answer I get is because they want 
to, uh, um, to destroy the state of Israel. They decided to have a nuclear program against Israel. Well, this, this, is, not this is not the reason. Uh, the reason for Iran to renew its nuclear program, and it's important to, to notice that, uh, was as a lesson they learned from the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and uh, again, I, I think the best way to understand the reason for Iran's nuclear activity is to go back to one story. Uh, and the story was told by Iran's former president, uh, Rafsanjani, in his memoirs. And uh, Rafsanjani, in, uh, during the 1990s, uh, he had uh, Rafsanjani had this uh, obsession with uh, publishing his memoirs about everything. So in one of the memoirs, he wrote uh, about a very important uh, discussion, a very important meeting Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, had in uh, 1987 uh, with the uh, official, with the high-ranking officials and commanders in Iran. I remind you, it was the seventh year of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, and Iran was in a very bad shape, uh, both economic uh, shape, uh, hundreds of thousands of Iranians being killed uh, by then uh, in the war. So the situation was very bad, and Khomeini in 1987 uh, convened a discussion, convened a meeting with all the high-ranking officials and, and commanders. Uh, and the, ask, the, the, the question he asked everyone was, what should we do in order to put an end to this war? How can we uh, uh, win this war? Uh, because the war has uh, terrible uh, consequences by, by, by now. And, uh, then he received a letter. He received a letter from uh, Mohsen Rezaei, who was back then the commander of the Revolutionary Guards of the IRGC. He couldn't attend the meeting because he was back in the, uh, in the front, but he sent Khomeini a letter. And in this letter, and this is a very important uh, and significant letter, uh, Rezaei said, well, we, we can't win this, this war in the, in the near future. But if you want to win the war, uh, we can do that. But I need several years. I need a lot of money. And if we have a lot of money, if we have enough money, and if we, if we have enough time, we can develop over the next few years special capabilities with regard to chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. And then we will be able to win this war. As soon as Khomeini received this letter from Rezaei, uh, he, un he immediately understood that there was no chance Iran could win this war because he had no time. He had, certainly didn't have enough money. So he, uh, uh, he was forced to what he called to drink the chalice of uh, poison and to accept uh, the ceasefire with, with Iraq. Now, let me remind you that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, the Iraqi uh, ruler used chemical weapons against Iranian, not just against Kurds in Iraq, but also against Iranians. So uh, the meaning of that was that in the Iran-Iraq war, the Iranians understood that they had no answer and no capability to deter the other uh, side, their enemies, from using mass destruction weapons against Iranian citizens, and they can do nothing uh, uh, in order to put an end to such a war if it happens. So the lesson they learned from the Iran-Iraq war was that they need to have a capability, a strategic capability to address their enemies. And by enemies, I mean any kind of enemy, whether it is Israel, the United States, uh, ISIS, Iraq, or uh, the Netherlands, whatever, uh, uh, whatever uh, enemy they have, uh, if this enemy wants to uh, use uh, mass destruction capabilities against Iran. If he wants to attack Iran, Iran has to develop a deterrence capability, which will make sure that uh, Iraq war will never happen again. And that was the reason for Iran to, the, to renew their nuclear program uh, in, the, in the late uh, 80s. Now, I would like to, few, to say a few words about the conception of, of, of Khamenei, about, uh, of, of, the son, of the Iranian uh, supreme leader when it comes to the nuclear issue. Iran 
doesn't want doesn't necessarily wants to have a nuclear weapon tomorrow morning or from uh, or a year from now uh, we do not think that there is a, a timeline a very concrete timeline saying that by the year 2025 Iran has to get nuclear weapon no this is not the situation Iran wants to have an option for military weapons with, with uh, which means that if in five years from today in two years from today in 10 years from today the supreme leader uh, of Iran whether it's Khamenei or someone else will receive information will receive intelligence that the enemies of Iran want to attack Iran uh, and he will ask his commanders just like Khomeini in 87 what should we do in order to prevent this from happening the answer he will receive is not the same answer he received Khomeini received from Rezaei the answer he wants to receive is that there, we, we have no problem just take the IEA inspectors out of Iran just kick them out of Iran we can uh, have a nuclear weapon in weeks or in several months. So that's where Iran wants to uh, uh, to reach. They want to have an, the option for a military weapons. So uh, the only thing which separates Iran from nuclear weapons is, uh, is some time, limited time, weeks or months, and a political decision. That's where Iran is heading for. Uh, Another thing which is very important to remember uh, is the conception in Iran saying that the nuclear program is just an excuse for the West and especially for the United States to uh, put more pressure on Iran. Uh, and whenever I, I, I'm, I'm being asked, do you think that there is any chance Iran will give up the option uh, for a military for, for a nuclear weapon the the answer is 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 no and the answer is no not just because they need this option as a deterrence to deter their enemies and look iran has learned not just the lessons of the iran iraq war they they learned the lessons of other countries in the in the region and in the world they know the difference between the way the united states has dealt against a country which has a nuclear option, North Korea, and the way the United States has acted against a country which did not possess nuclear weapons capabilities, Iraq. And they know the difference between that and they don't want to be Iraq. They don't want to be North Korea when it comes to the economy, but they want to be a country which has the immunity from a, an American attack. They also learned another lesson from uh, the, one of the leaders in the Arab world who was used to be to be called uh, Al Majnun, the crazy one, and I refer to uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, and uh, 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 and after Gaddafi was forced to give up his nuclear program after international sanctions, this was a very important lesson for Iran because whenever you 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 listen to Khamenei and other officials in Iran, they keep saying uh, during the last decade he was indeed crazy. If he was not. Uh, if he didn't give up his nuclear uh, program, he could still be the leader of Libya. Because when you have this uh, uh, insurance called a nuclear program, nobody wants to deal with you. So this is a very important issue, and this is a very, very, a very important reminder to Iran why they should have this nuclear uh, uh, program. And another thing is, as I said before, they uh, really believe that the nuclear problem is just an excuse. What, what I mean by that? If you ask Khamenei, is there a possibility that you will uh, go tomorrow to the television and say, you know, like Khamenei, I'm ready to drink the chalice of poison. I'm ready to give up the, the nuclear, my, my nuclear program because it has uh, severe economic implications to Iran. The, the answer is no. And when you ask why not, uh, Khamenei will tell you because uh, if I give up the, my nuclear program, the West and especially the United States will just find another excuse to put more pressure on Iran because they are just using the, the nuclear issue, the nuclear program as an excuse to put more sanctions and more pressure on, on Iran. And if I, even if I give up, even if Iran gives up 
its nuclear program, they will just find other excuses. If I give up the nuclear issue, they will say, well, but you haven't given up your missiles. If I give up the missiles, they will say, yes, but you still haven't recognized the state of Israel. If I recognize the state of Israel, they will say, yes, but you still, uh, uh, the, the human rights situation in Iran is still in terrible shape. So I will never be able to satisfy the West. They will just uh, try to use other uh, excuses to put more pressure on Iran, because as Khamenei says again and again, the problem the United States has is not with the nuclear, the possibility of a nuclear Iran, but with the possibility, well, but with the situation, with the reality of Islamic Iran. They don't have any problem with the nuclear Iran. They have a problem with the Islamic Iran. And as long as they don't have a regime change in Iran, they will continue to put more pressure on Iran in order to force it into more and more uh, concessions. Let me address a little bit the situation right now when it comes to the nuclear issue and the JCPOA. Uh, and I'm not going to get into this uh, uh, very well-known discussion uh, concerning whether the JCPOA was bad or, uh, or good. Uh, the Israeli position is very clear. If Iran will, cannot obtain nuclear weapon, never, because the combination between a regime which, uh, whose uh, uh, objective, whose uh, vision is to destroy the state of Israel with nuclear weapons capabilities is something which Israel cannot live with. But there is another issue because th this Israeli objective is shared with our countries in the world, including the EU and the United States and even Russia and China. Nobody wants Iran to uh, obtain nuclear weapon. But the Israeli position is a little more complicated because what Israel has been saying is that it's not enough to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. It's important to prevent Iran from reaching the point where it's only weeks away or month away from what is called the breakout capability. So Iran should not be given the opportunity to be a short distance from breakout capability because uh, this, uh, this will be a very risky situation for Israel because Israel, unlike the United States, for example, cannot, uh, cannot use, do not, do not have the, uh, the operational uh, uh, capabilities to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons uh, country if it decides to do that when it's only weeks or months away from, uh, uh, from a nuclear weapon. So there is a consensus in Israel saying we should not allow Iran to, to be so close to a nuclear weapon. The, the question, of course, and this is a debate going on between Israel and other states and even uh, inside Israel, what is the best way to do that? What is the best way to prevent Iran from reaching this point of being too close uh, to nuclear weapon and especially to break out to nuclear weapon? And there are, of course, three main uh, ways or three main options to delay or to prevent Iran from, get, from getting there. The first option is, of course, the military option. Uh, the military option, uh, let, let me be very clear about it. I, nobody in Israel, nobody in Israel wants to get there. Nobody in Israel wants to use a military option against, against Iran. It's very complicated. It's possible, but it's very complicated. Nobody can tell uh, what the implications of such an attack will, will have, uh, whether it will just delay Iran's nuclearization in a matter of a few years, perhaps less, perhaps more. Uh, Israel cannot, cannot do, cannot use this option without the consent of the United States, because even if the United States is not directly involved in such an attack, it might have uh, implications for US forces in the region. So I find it very difficult to believe that Israel will use this option without a green light, at least a green light from the United States to do that. But having said that, this is one option. And I have to say that my impression, my sense is that if, if Iran gets uh, too close to a nuclear weapon and nobody else does the work uh, for Israel, Israel might, uh, might be willing to uh, to, uh, um, to decide on this option as well. The second option is what is called the, the covert 
uh, operations inside Iran, such as the operation carried out and attributed to the Mossad a few months ago in Natanz. Uh, this operation can certainly delay Iran's uh, ambition, nuclear ambitions. The two problems with this option is first that uh, they, are, uh, they can delay the process of nuclearization in Iran, but only uh, in, in a few months, perhaps a year or so, uh, if you take, for example, the recent attack, uh, again, attributed to Israel in Natanz, we already know that some of the infrastructure is being delivered to a new site uh, in Natanz, which is under the ground. So it's not easy to do that. And of course, there is another issue of, uh, uh, of, of the way it gives the other side uh, the, uh, the opportunity to improve its capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Israeli covert uh, operations. So if, you, if, for example, Israel uses uh, cyber attacks to delay Iran's nuclear program, uh, it's only a matter of time until the Iranians uh, know how to improve their security uh, infrastructure in a way which will make it much more difficult in the future. So, th so this is the, the, the second option. The third option is, of course, the diplomatic option. Uh, and, and here I would like to say a few words about uh, both the Israeli uh, position and the Iranian position concerning the JCPOA, uh, as we are uh, facing a very, uh, very uh, significant time right now with the new administration in, in Washington. The Israeli position, and again, I, I do not represent the, 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 the official position of the state of Israel, uh, but this is the Israeli uh, prime minister's uh, position right now. The United States, according to the Israeli official position, uh, should not go back to the J JCPOA. First of all, because the JCPOA was a flow deal. There were, there were a lot of uh, problems with, with the deal. For example, the issue of uh, sunset clauses, which means that most restrictions, most limitations on Iran's nuclear program are going to be removed from the eighth to the 15th year. Then you have the issue of uh, research and development of uh, advanced centrifuges, and there were other problems within the JCPOA. So even in, 19, in 2015, the Israeli position was that it was a very bad deal and that, uh, uh, and that it was good for President Trump to withdraw from the deal and President Biden should not go back, uh, back to the JCPOA. Now, this was the Israeli position in 2015 and since then, but uh, something has, has changed since then. And the problem is that today we're in 2021. So that means that if both the United States and Iran go back to the JCPOA, that leaves us uh, approximately four years until the sunset closes begin. So this is even more problematic than the situation we were in 2015. Uh, people asked me uh, over the last few weeks, uh, uh, why, uh, why the chief of staff, uh, Aviv Kohavi, in his recent speech at the INSS, said that he was totally against the uh, going back uh, to the JCPOA. Well, we know that some Israeli security officials back then in 2015 uh, said that perhaps it wasn't the best deal uh, ever signed in human history, but it was a deal that Israel could live with. Uh, why did some of uh, the, the people and some of the officials who supported the, the JCPOA back then have changed, have changed their mind? And the reason for that is because we are uh, we we are in 2021 and not in, two, in, in 2015. So uh, uh, there there are people who supported the deal back then, but they are very concerned with the possibility of going back to the JCPOA when we are only a few years away from uh, sunset uh, closes. My impression is that it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to square the circle and to bridge between the Israeli uh, position right now and the new administration in Washington position towards going back to the JCPOA. I think going back to the JCPOA is technically possible, but uh, the question is whether they have uh, the political will to do that. And again, my sense is that the new administration in Washington, the new Biden administration certainly has the political will to go back to the JCPOA as a basis, as a base to continue its efforts to convince the Iranians to reach a better extended JCPOA. But first, let's go back to the JCPOA and negotiate from that point. 
Uh, I think it will be, again, again, it will be very difficult to bridge between the Israeli position and the US position. Uh, and if Israel does not uh, succeed to convince the Americans to change their minds and to go back to the JCPOA, I'm not sure that Israel can do a lot uh, about it. Uh, the problem, the biggest problem perhaps, is that unfortunately, uh, this issue should, uh, cannot be resolved between Israel and the United States because the negotiations are not between the, the Israel and the United because between Israel and the United States, but between Iran and the United States, or between Iran and the P5 plus one. And let me very, be very clear about the Israel about the, the Iranian position. I think, and I have some disagreements with some of my colleagues concerning the Iranian position. My personal opinion is that there are two uh, main demands raised by Iran, which are not going uh, to change. And uh, these are not opening positions. They are not going to change in my assessment. The first position of Iran is that they will not go back to compliance with the JCPOA as long as the sanctions are not removed. We, the Iranians, will not go back to compliance with the JCPOA, we will not roll back the nuclear activity we've undertaken over the last year since Iran be began to reduce its commitment to the JCPOA as long as the sanctions are there. They are ready, as implied by Foreign Minister Zarif last week, they are ready for a gradual uh, return to the JCPOA, which means if you can't, if you, the Americans, can't remove all sanctions right now, we are ready for, for uh, initial steps, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, allow some exports of Iranian oil in exchange for freezing or Iran's freezing its uh, uh, enrichment of uranium to 20%. This gradual, uh, um, uh, gradual uh, solution might work for Iran as well, but they will never, in my view, uh, give up the idea of going back to compliance in exchange for full removal of the sanctions. So this is the first Iranian uh, position. The second uh, position is that they are not ready to renegotiate the JCPOA. In the future, perhaps they will be ready to go back to the table and perhaps discuss the possibility of uh, extending the deal because Iran has also demands of its own. For example, Iran wants uh, not just the secondary sanctions to be removed, but also the primary sanctions to be removed. So if uh, and it won't happen tomorrow and it won't happen in the near future. But in, in the future, perhaps there is a possibility that Iran will be, able, will be ready to go back to talks over the JCPOA and to, the, to extend the JCPOA, but it will have its own demands. But its position right now is that even if you want to discuss other issues and if you want to discuss the extension of the JCPOA, first go back to the original JCPOA. And again, I do not, I, I think we should be very realistic and understand that Iran will not change its position. Why? Because if tomorrow morning Khamenei is going to appear on, on national TV and say, you know what, I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to, re to renegotiate the JCPOA even before going back to the original JCPOA. The meaning of that is that Khamenei actually acknowledges and admits that the maximum pressure policy used by President Trump worked. And, that, uh, and he, can't, he can't allow himself to do that because if he does that, it will create a, precedence, a, a precedent uh, saying that in the future, any American administration can use, can reuse sanctions and reimpose sanctions in order to change Iran. So the Iranian position is very clear. We've discussed for years the JCPOA, we negotiated for years the JCPOA. This is a done deal. If you want to discuss other issues, that's okay with us, but first go back to uh, the JCPOA. So again, I do not see any way to bridge between this position of Iran, the US position and the Israeli position. Let me, I, I see that our time is, uh, um, is, is, uh, is approaching the, the end of my presentation. So let me just few, uh, say a few, a few words about the two other uh, threats or challenges from Iran. The second issue is of course the issue of missiles. And when I'm talking about missiles, I'm, I'm talking both about the long range missiles uh, 
from directly from Iran and the missiles Iran is uh, delivering to Israeli neighbors, mostly Hezbollah. Uh, in the past, when Israel spoke about the threat of missiles, it's usually referred to the danger of the Iranian long range missiles being used as a platform to deliver nuclear weapon. But this is not the only uh, problem uh, we have with the missiles because what Iran has been trying to do over the last few years is to increase both the uh, quality and the quantity of the missiles surrounding Israel, especially from Lebanon, but also from Syria, in order to create an immunity from Israeli attack against nuclear sites in Iran. And again, here is, a, is a, uh, Iran has learned a lesson from North Korea. If you ask the South Koreans, what is the, major, what is the most important, what is the most severe uh, threat to the security of South Korea, they will probably not tell you the nuclear issue. They will tell you the missiles, the longer the, the, the missiles targeted uh, uh, launch, which might be launched against South Korea. And Iran knows that. Iran knows that if it, it succeeds in uh, surrounding Israel by hundreds of thousands of uh, rockets and missiles, and especially precise rockets and missiles, as they've been trying to do uh, with Hezbollah, it will put uh, an obstacle on the way of Israel to uh, attack Iran. I wouldn't say that it will destroy all possibility of Israeli activity against Iran, but it certainly is a deterrence against Israel to use its force against Iran. So that's what the Iranians are doing. And again, in this, uh, I have to say again, realistically, I don't like this, but I have to say that there is no way Iran is going to negotiate the missiles and its long range missiles with the international community. There is no way. Whenever I'm asked, uh, do you think there is a possibility to discuss the, the issue of the missiles in uh, JCPOA plus? My, my short answer is no. Why? Because the Iranians uh, consider their long range missiles as their, I would say, their only real deterrence capability against their enemies. Uh, so they will never uh, be, be uh, they will never be able to 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 uh, uh, to discuss it. Um, they might be able, by they might be ready to discuss the range of the missiles. But then you have another problem because if even if they are ready to discuss the range of the missiles and say, for example, we are ready to stop developing produce uh, developing uh, missiles over two thousand kilometers that doesn't help the state of Israel, which is within the range of the existing missiles uh, of, uh, of Iran. I would like to say a few words about uh, Iran's regional policy as well. Look, if you, if you look at the Iranian uh, regional performance over the last decade, you certainly get the impression that this is uh, a success story. I mean, if you look at the level of uh, Iranian involvement in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Gaza, and you compare that to what used to be uh, to, to the Iranian influence and the Iranian activity uh, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, they have certainly made a very successful efforts in the region to expand their influence and their activity. Uh, if, if Iran has a say in deciding who is going to be the prime minister of Iraq, that means that Iran has a very significant impact and, and influence in, in, uh, in, in Iraq. If the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, are positioned in, for the first time in Syria, this is a big su success for Iran. If Iran is involved in Yemen and uh, continued its efforts with Hezbollah and in Gaza, this means that Iran has, has, has succeeded to increase its influence in the region. But let me tell you, but let me say something which is very important. I would say that this success story of Iran is uh, more a result of the weakness of the Arab world rather than the strength of Iran itself. And what Iran, Iran has managed to do over the last decade is to use the opportunities 
and to use the weakness of the Arab world in order to increase its own uh, strength and its own influence in the region. And we, we, should not we should not forget that despite all those successes, both political and economic and, uh, and military successes of Iran in the region, they suffer from major constraints and major problems when it comes to their activity in the region. I don't have the time to elaborate on, on all of those problems, but let me just uh, point, point out a few, of days, a, few, a few of them. Iran is a Persian state working in an environment which is mostly Arab. And this is a very big problem because uh, most Arabs, I will tell you, dislike Iranians because they consider them as the Persians uh, foreigners. Uh, they are not a part of the Arab world. And, and they have, uh, and they are right, because the Iranians, when they treat uh, the Arabs, they treat them, uh, I would say that there are a lot of racist uh, elements in the way Iran treats the, Arab, uh, uh, the, the Arabs. I remember a very, very interesting uh, research carried out a few years ago by, uh, by a US scholar, American scholar, and she interviewed fighters uh, from Hezbollah in Lebanon, who used to fight alongside the revolutionary guards in Syria. And, uh, and they, they all agreed that the IRGC supported them and delivered them weapon. But they said, uh, whenever we had an, in, uh, an, inter, uh, an interaction with our Iranian commanders, we could, we, we could see the, 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 this uh, disrespect of the Iranians towards the Hezbollah because we are Arabs and they are the Persians, they are the, the, the Iranians. So Iran has a lot of problems when it works in an, in an environment populated mostly by Arabs. So this is one problem. The second problem is, of course, that Iran is a Shiite country working in a, in a, uh, in, in a region mostly populated by Sunnis. And yes, there is a, uh, there is a problem. Now, it, it doesn't mean that Iran doesn't work with Sunni organization as well. As well. It works with Hamas, it works with, with the Islamic, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, it works with Sunnis uh, all over the world. Uh, they even work with Al-Qaeda. But still, there is a problem working with Sunnis because the Sunnis will never accept the, uh, uh, the, the, the Iranian uh, I would say religious uh, uh, authority as some of the Shiites, and uh, if it that if that's not enough, I, I, I would have to say that Iran suffers from major constraints even when it comes to working with Shiites. And uh, if you look at what happened, what's happened in in Beirut or what's happened in Iraq over the last uh, few years, you can see that there are growing voices within the Shiite communities, both in Lebanon and in Iraq, saying, yes, we appreciate the support given to us by Iran, but we are not ready to accept the Iranian uh, interference in our daily day life. And if you remember uh, two, two years ago, for example, when there were uh, protests going on in southern Iraq, in Basra, and uh, the protesters and the demonstrators in, in Basra uh, put the Iranian consulate in Basra on fire, uh, they set it on fire, and those those were not Sunnis. They were Shiites who are mostly uh, Iraqi patriots who don't want Iran to be that involved in Iraq. And if you take the most important uh, Iraqi cleric uh, in uh, Shiite cleric in Iraq, Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Sistani, he wants good relations and friendly relations between Iran and Iraq, but he's not ready that the commander of the Quds Force. Qasem Soleimani, uh, or his, uh, his successor, Ismail Ani, will be so uh, involved in the political process inside Iraq. So there are a lot of problems uh, 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 facing I Iran in the region. And I didn't mention that they have to, to work with other players in the region, either Israel in Syria, or, or Russia in Syria, or the United States in Iraq. So there are a lot of problems. And we have to remember that uh, when it comes to, to Iran. When it comes to Israel, the main story today is Iran involvement in Syria. And now again, as I said uh, when I spoke about the nuclear issue, issue Iran did not uh, arrive in Syria because of Israel. Iran sent its uh, proxies to Syria because it was very concerned that Assad would fall. 
Iran was very concerned that, uh, to, to, to lose this strategic cooperation between Iran and Syria. Iran was very concerned that if Assad leaves, that might have uh, a devastating impact on Iran's ability to support Lebanese Hezbollah when it comes to Israel. So, uh, so it, it uh, sent proxies, it sent Hezbollah, it sent the Iraqi and Afghans and Pakistani Shiite uh, to, to work and to fight alongside Assad. And when it didn't help, they had to send in 2015, they had to send the revolutionary guards to, to, join, uh, to join them. But what Iran has been doing over the last few years is to use this opportunity to expand its presence against Israel. So it didn't arrive in Syria because of Israel, but it stays. It, is stay, it stays in Syria because of, uh, because of Israel. And what we can see again and again when it comes to Iran is that Iran has this amazing uh, uh, ability to turn threats into opportunities. There was a very big threat in Syria, ISIS and the rebels against Assad, and they used this threat and turned them into an opportunity to entrench itself in Syria and in Iraq, to in, in expand its influence in Iran, in, in Iraq and Syria. I always, uh, uh, I always say that uh, one, of the, one of the differences between Iran and Israel is that Iran has the capability of turning uh, threats into opportunities, while Israel something, sometimes has the capability, have, have the, the uh, try to use, to, to turn uh, opportunities into threats. So that, that's one of the, what are the differences between Iran and Israel? And sometimes we should adopt perhaps the, the Iranian approach. Uh, there is an ongoing debate right now whether we should try and discuss, I mean, not, not we, the Americans, should use, uh, to, should use the, uh, the negotiation with Iran over the next stage of the JCPOA to discuss regional issues as well. I have to say I'm not that optimistic. Again, uh, I think that Iran it's not that Iran is not willing to discuss regional issues, but the Iranian position is very clear. If you want to discuss regional, uh, uh, regional, uh, our regional activity, we have two demands. One, the Americans should cannot be a part of such uh, discussions because the U.S. is not part of the solution; it's part of the problem. So, if you want to solve the problems in the, in the Middle East, first of all, uh, you have to pull out the, the U.S. forces from from the Middle East. And then the Iranians are saying, if you want to discuss our activity in Syria and Iraq and, uh, uh, and Yemen, we are ready to do that. But first of all, let's discuss the Saudi involvement in Yemen, and let's discuss the Turkish involvement in Syria and Iraq, and let's discuss the involvement of other of Israel in Syria and Lebanon. So we are ready to discuss everything, but within a regional framework and not uh, within the Americans, uh, not with the Americans. And again, I think it will be very pro problematic to, uh, to, to negotiate regional issues with Iran within the framework of the JCPOA. It doesn't mean, of course, that we cannot deal with Iran's regional uh, activity. There are a lot of ways to do that. I think that what Israel has been doing in Syria against Iranian uh, entrenchment in Syria is, is very effective. It's not 100%, 100% successful, but it has managed to delay the Iranian entrenchment in Syria very well. And there are other ways to deal with the Iranian activity. For example, in Iraq, if you want to, uh, to limit the extent of Iranian involvement in Iraq, it is possible to do that by, uh, by uh, giving Ira the, Ir the Iraqis and the Iraqi government an alternative to the Iranian influence, for example, by uh, by increasing the, uh, the, the economic activities of other partners working in, in Iraq. I would like to end by making three short uh, remarks. First, we have to remember there are other voices in Iran concerning Israel. Let me be, uh, let, let me be a little optimistic. There are, uh, there are other voices. Um, take, for example, the daughter of, uh, of someone I, I, I mentioned before, Rafsanjani. Rafsanjani was the former pre president of Iran. He has a very uh, known daughter called Faizeh. And Faizeh gave a very interesting uh, interview a few weeks ago uh, to an Iranian newspaper. She lives in Iran. So that, that's what make, ma makes her, this uh, interview very interesting. And she said, look, 
Uh, I admit that Israel is an occupying, oppressing state in the Middle East. I admit that, and we should accept that. But we have to think what is the best way for Iran to deal with, with this situation. And the best way is not to try and fight against Israel, but to try and change our attitude towards Israel. And in a situation where the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia and some of the Arab states are ready to change their attitude towards Israel, I think she said that it is reasonable enough to expect the Iranian government to reconsider its attitude toward Israel as well. And I remember an Iranian intellectual and professor for uh, political science, uh, Sadek Zibagalam, Sadek Zibakalam, and uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, he was invited to to give a, a, um, a speech in one of the universities in, in Iran. And then you could see that the Basijis, the members of the uh, IRGC militia, uh, painted a, a big flag of Israel uh, at the entrance to the university uh, because they knew his uh, position towards Israel. And you can see that when he arrived at the, uh, at the university. Uh, he just uh, moved across the, the flag in order not to uh, not to walk on the on the flag of Israel. So yes, there are other voices in Iran concerning Israel. The problem is that those voices have no influence whatsoever on the decision making in Iran. That's why I said before, as long as Khamenei is there, I do not think there is any chance, not just of. Uh, uh, better relations between Iran and Israel, but not even of a uh, of, uh, uh, secret uh, dialogue between uh, both governments. I would really want this, uh, this situation to change, but unfortunately I can't see that as long, at least as long as Khamenei is there. My second remark is that uh, in the end, if the Iranian regime, as long as the, the current Iranian regime is there, I see no change, not just in the Iranian position towards Israel, but in many other aspects as well. I do not see a significant change in Iran's policy towards the United States. I do not see any change in Iran's policy towards human rights issues. I do not see any kind of change uh, in Iranian position towards, uh, towards its own citizens, uh, um, as long as the Iranian regime is there. So perhaps you could say that the only real uh, possibility for a major change in Iran is a regime change. Unfortunately, this is not in our hands. And I think that one of the mistakes is to expect uh, Israel or even the United States to carry out uh, a strategy or a policy which will enable a regime change in Iran. This will not happen in Washington and it won't happen in Jerusalem and it won't happen in Canada or in Sweden. You can do a lot of things to uh, empower the Iranian, uh, the Iranian dissidents working inside Iran. You can perhaps uh, give them uh, capabilities to uh, better communication between them, but uh, a regime change is nothing you can force on Iran. And unfortunately, I have to say that 42 years after the revolution, and I keep hearing again and again, again that Iran is on the verge of a regime change, Iran is on the verge of economic collapse. My assessment, unfortunately, is that this is wishful thinking. Iran is not on the verge of a regime change. We have to be very honest, change, changes might happen in the future. But I think that the regime is, st is, is still very powerful. We could see uh, its capabilities in recent protests in Iran, uh, recent protests in December 2019, where it killed uh, hundreds and perhaps thousands of Iranian protesters uh, in order to, to, to put an end to the, the protest in Iran. And when you ask many Iranians, I have to say, you have, you, when you ask many Iranians, why don't you go to the streets? and try to uh, carry out a regime change, it's not just about fear. It's about uh, many Iranians concern uh, about the uh, alternative. And many Iranians will tell you, yes, we are not pleased with the, with our, with, with the situation right now. We, are not, we, we would like to see another regime in Tehran, but we are afraid 
that if we try to use violence in order to uh, topple the regime, we might find ourselves in the same situation of Syria or in Iraq or in Yemen or, or in Libya. A revolution is something you, you, you know how you start, but you can't know how it ends. And the possibility of chaos and violence is very much uh, something which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, the, the Iranians uh, are very concerned about. And my last remark uh, would be would be that in one of my trips to Europe uh, before COVID, uh, I was asked, well, what, what do you think uh, our approach, or the European approach towards Iran should be? And I said, well, I don't know what your, your approach should be, but I would uh, recommend you, just as I recommend uh, my Israeli colleagues, to avoid two things. One is to avoid alarmist uh, approach towards Iran. Yes, Iran has a lot of successes, Iran has a lot of strength, but Iran has also a lot of constraints and a lot of weaknesses, and we should look how to uh, weaken Iran even further, and we should not uh, uh, approach Iran as a, as, a, as a state who can do anything it wants to do. No, this is not the right approach. The second, uh, the, the, my second advice is to avoid wishful thinking. Iran is not going to disappear, and the Islamic regime is probably not going to disappear. Iran is here to stay. And I think that uh, any kind of a strategy which uh, assesses that by this strategy, we'll be able to, uh, uh, to make uh, the Iranian regime disappear is not a good base for strategy. That's why I personally was not in favor of the maximum pressure policy uh, of President Trump, not because I thought that the JCPOA was a very good deal, but because I didn't believe, and unfortunately I was right, I did not believe that Iran will be forced into more concessions. I did not think that it will uh, uh, accelerate regime change in Iran. Uh, and I think that when you look even at Iranian economy, you can see how the Iranian economy is resilient. And, uh, and all those expectations that uh, will just put a lot of pressure on Iran and in a matter of uh, three, four months, the Iranian regime is going to collapse. This is not the way to, uh, to, uh, to, to have a very successful and good, uh, and good strategy towards Iran. We have to be very realistic. We have to be, uh, and we have to avoid wishful thinking. So I'll stop by here and I will be more than happy to address any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim, for your uh, lecture. Uh, some questions are in Dutch, so maybe it's an idea that I uh, try to moderate them and read them out to you. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you see a revolution of the Iranian population coming? And could Israel play a role in that in the background as the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu in the past has recorded video messages to the Iranian people? Well, look, I think uh i think it's a good thing for prime minister netanyahu and believe me i don't have a lot of uh, good words to say about him but one of the good things i have to good uh, to, to say about him that he was he managed over the years to make this separation between and this distinction between the iranian regime and the iranian people this is very important i think it's very important to make this distinction between the iranian people most of them do not hate israelis I wouldn't say that most of them wants to have good relations with Israel because we have to remember that 70% of the Iranians were born after the revolution, so they were indoctrinated against Israel, but most of them, at least some of them want to have good relations with Israel. Uh, but uh, I have to say uh, two things. One, I think it's uh, very problematic, uh, especially for Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, to try and work with the Iranian public opinion because Netanyahu, uh, especially Netanyahu, uh, is considered by many Iranians, not just by supporters of the regime, but by many ordinary Iranians, as the one who is responsible for the sanctions against Iran and for the pressure against Iran. So I, I know a lot of Iranians who are, are not fans of, uh, not supporters of the Iranian regime, but they don't like Prime Minister Netanyahu, because they consider him as the reason for many of the of the of the of the problems. So I think I'm certainly in favor of uh, 
inter uh, for, uh, di dialogue between peoples and cultural dialogue and uh, and the uh, Iranian uh, singer in, in Israeli singer born in Iran sending her uh, her clips uh, back to, to to Iran and that that's very good. But in the end, we have to remember that the decisions are not made by ordinary Iranians. They are made in Tehran by Khamenei, by the Supreme National Security Council. Uh, and unfortunately, as I said before, they are, Khamenei is so obsessed with Israel and with his, uh, uh, his hostility towards Israel that it, it doesn't really uh, uh, matter what kind of relations we will have between the Iranian and Israeli people. What matters is what uh, he will do. The next question is, how do you foresee the coming elections in Iran and who will replace the current president, Rouhani? Okay, well, that's a very tricky question. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, let, let, me, let me tell you a, 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 a story. Uh, back in, in 1997, uh, I was an officer in the Israeli army working on Iran. And uh, there were two candidates, main candidates in the election in 1970 in Iran. One, uh, was someone uh, who I, I'm not sure you are familiar with. He's called Natek Nuri. Natek Nuri was the, chair, the chairman, the speaker of the Iranian parliament back then. And everyone thought that he was going to win the election because he was a conservative candidate who was supported by the religious establishment in Iran. Uh, and the other candidate was uh, uh, an, a former uh, minister in Iran back in the 80s, but his uh, recent uh, job before uh, the election, he was the director of the National Library of Tehran, which we, you might agree with it that this is not the, the natural uh, position for someone who wants to become the president of Iran. His name was Mohammad Khatami. And he won uh, a landslide uh, victory in 1997. And I remember just after the election, there was a uh, meeting with the, the head of the Israeli intelligence, uh, Bogi Alon, who was later become, to become the Israeli uh, defense minister. And uh, I remember the, the people from the research division of the Israeli intelligence uh, trying to explain why everything was, why everyone was thinking that, uh, that Natik Nuri is going to, uh, to win the election. And the, the, at the end of the discussion, uh, yeah, Alon came and said, you know what, if you can't predict the election results in your own country, in Israel, don't try to uh, predict the election results in other countries. Having said that, it's, I, I really think it's, it's, too, it's too early to say because we still don't know who the candidates are going to be. We, uh, we do know that real reformist candidates, real moderate candidates, uh, are not going to be uh, allowed to participate in the election. And uh, we, we had the parliamentary elections in Iran last uh, February, and we saw that the so-called Guardian Council in Iran disqualified most of the so-called moderate reformist candidates. So this will be the same here. Uh, the reformists are putting more and more pressure on Foreign Minister Zarif to, uh, to agree to participate. I think, uh, I, I don't think it will happen. I don't think he will, uh, he will be ready to do that. And if he doesn't uh, accept, uh, accept the cause, we, we will probably uh, have uh, two or three, three main candidates. Then the most obvious names right now, but nobody is still uh, um, announced his uh, candidacy. One is, the, is Ali Larijani. Ali Larijani was the former speaker of the Iranian Majlis. Is uh, considered to be, I would say, uh, a pragmatic conservative. He supported the Rouhani, he supported the JCPOA. So this is perhaps the the, the most optimistic president we can uh, uh, we can we can uh, wait. And on the other hand, we have other uh, uh, possible candidates, such as the current speaker of the Majlis and the former mayor of Tehran, uh, Mohammad Bakr Walibaf. He might also be a candidate. Uh, you might, we might have the Ibrahim Raisi, the hardliner uh, cleric running again. Uh, we have several ca possible candidates who come from the ranks of the Revolutionary Guards, such as Hossein de Khan, who used to be the, the defense minister, and now he's uh, one of the advisors to Khamenei. But in the, the, the bottom line is that 
uh, I can't tell, I can't predict the result, but uh, the, 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 the possibility is that the, the, the election will be between, I would say, hardliners and pragmatic conservatives. So uh, whether it's Ali Larijani or Ali Bar, I, I'm not sure there will be that, uh, it, it won't matter uh, too much. Uh, it's very, uh, I, would, I would definitely say that the next president of Iran will be uh, more hardliner than the current one, the, the Rouhani. And Rouhani is not a moderate, I think he's also a pragmatic conservative. So the next, prime, the next uh, president is going to be uh, even more hardliner. But we have to remember that the most strategic decisions in Iran uh, are made not by the president, but by the supreme leader. So uh, that's something we have to remember. Uh, could you elaborate more on the activities of Iran in Gaza, its relation with Hamas? Are they being practical or what about the differences between Sunni and Shia? Are they not elementary? Can they be overcome? Okay, I think, so, but I think Islamic Jihad would exactly. also play a role in the equation. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, as I said before, uh, the, the issue of Sunnis versus the Shiites is something uh, which, is, which is sometimes uh, overemphasized. Uh, if you remember a few weeks ago, a few months ago, there was a report about uh, an operation, again, uh, attributed to the Mossad uh, in Tehran, uh, killing one of the activists of Al-Qaeda in Tehran. And then the question was, how come the Iranians give, uh, uh, give uh, safe haven to, uh, uh, to someone who works for Al-Qaeda? Because Al-Qaeda, we know, is a, very, is a radical Sunni organization. They hate the Shiites. Uh, but it's it's all a matter of, of interest. So uh, so when Iran wants to operate in Gaza and it wants to expand its influence in Gaza, it has to work with the, with the Sunnis because there is no there is no one single Shia <laughs> living in Gaza. Uh, so they have to work with them, and that, that's a problem. Uh, I, I would say that the most strategic relation is not between Iran and Hamas, but between but between Iran and the PIJ, the, Islamic, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a smaller organization, but it is more willing, it has always been more willing to accept uh, um, the, the dictates and the, 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 um, the, the messages from Iran, because it's smaller and it needs Iran more. Hamas was always um, a more, dif more difficult organization for the Iranians to work with, uh, not because it's not because they are Sunni, because the PIJ is also Sunni, but because the Hamas is a part of the Islamic uh, Brothers, and uh, they were always uh, been very suspicious towards the Shia, towards the Iranian, and they were also be very uh, determined to uh, maintain their independence. Uh, and we also uh, remember that when the Hamas had to, to choose or to make a strategic decision whether to support President Assad in Syria uh, or to support the opposition to Assad a few years ago, they actually decided to support the opposition. Uh, and that was a very big blow to the relationship between Iran and Hamas. And, the, and Iran still remembers uh, how the Hamas uh, uh, turned away from, from Iran. So I would say that there are still good relations between Iran and the Islamic Palestinians. Uh, both with the PIJ, but also with the Hamas. They could they try to uh, deliver uh, weapons. It's not easy. It's not easy because uh, I would say that the most convenient way Iran used to deliver weapons to Gaza was uh, through Sudan uh, in, uh, years, years away, years before. And Sudan, as you know, uh, changed its uh, policy. If they, and it's very difficult for Iran to do that. Uh, so I think that there are good relations, but the level of Iranian involvement in Gaza uh, should not be um, over, uh, over, over a certain. Somebody asks, could you tell more about Iran's geopolitical ambitions in the Middle East and the Arabic Peninsula, not just its defensive military strategy, but also their regional aspirations? Well, uh, to, to be, the short answer will be that Iran wants to, uh, uh, to, to be recognized as a regional uh, power in the Middle East and to expand its influence uh, in the region. Now, of course, there are differences between the different arenas in the region and Iran has different 
uh, interest in, 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 in different parts of the Middle East. I would say that uh, Iran doesn't want to occupy uh, territories. And Iran usually, by the way, doesn't work directly uh, when it comes to its military presence. Uh, Syria is, is the exception. Uh, they had to, as I said before, they had to, to send RGC to Syria because uh, all, the, all their activities through proxies failed to, uh, to, 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 to achieve the, the, uh, the, the result of uh, saving Assad. So they had to, to, to send the RGC. But when it comes to Yemen, for example, I would say that Yemen is not that important, but, uh, but they had to be uh, engaged in Yemen because uh, that's part of their uh, rivalry with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, Iraq, I would say, is the number one priority for, for, for Iran, not just because of the long border between the two states, but because Iran is, uh, uh, considers Iran, Iraq as a very important economic uh, partner it is using Iraq to bypass the sanctions. It is using uh, Iraq to, and, and it wants to make sure Iran, Iraq will not be uh, again a country from which there will be a threat to the interests of Iran, whether the U.S. interests or uh, or ISIS uh, presence in Iraq. So I would say that the the the, the overall uh, ambitions of Iran is to uh, maintain a major power in the region. A major strategic uh, uh, to, to, to enjoy major a strategic uh, position in the region uh, and to use the different parts of the Middle East, including the Persian Gulf, to pursue its uh, its overall strategic uh, objectives, not just in the region but also uh, worldwide. So we, we all remember, uh, for example, the the series of uh, of Iranian activities in the Persian Gulf. Uh, a year ago and uh, two years ago, which was a part of uh, a more broader strategy of uh, maximum uh, maximum uh, uh, resistance uh, strategy used by Iran to deal with the maximum pressure policy of President Trump. So they certainly used their uh, influence both in Iraq and in the Persian Gulf to uh, to make a toll from the Americans uh, um, following their uh, their pressure. Can Hezbollah act towards Israel independently from Iran? Technically, yes. I mean, uh, the, the missiles are there, uh, and technically they can do that, but but they will never do that. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, le, le, if we go back to the Second Lebanese War, for example, uh, we know that the Iranians were not uh, supportive of the uh, Hezbollah initiative uh, to, uh, to kidnap the Israeli soldiers, which uh, escalated into a war with Israel. Because you have to remember, uh, the Hezbollah capabilities, which most, most of them come from Iran, I would say 90% more from the military capabilities of Hezbollah come from, from Iran. And the Iranians do not support Hezbollah for the sake of uh, tactical, uh, uh, operation against Israel. They don't want to. Uh, to, to they, they are not. Uh, they don't want to. Have to uh, Israel and Hezbollah being engaged in a in a in a, uh, in a confrontation over a minor issue of uh, Israeli soldiers being uh, kidnapped by Hezbollah. They want Hezbollah to have all those capabilities uh, for the day when the Zionists are going to use their air force to attack nuclear facilities inside Iran. So uh, I wouldn't say that uh, Hezbollah would, uh, would do anything without Iranian consent. Uh, the problem is that sometimes you find yourself in a situation which is an escalat escalatory uh, situation. So for example, if uh, Hezbollah wants to retaliate to an Israeli uh, attack against Hezbollah uh, base, uh, or against Hezbollah members in, Lebanon, in, in Syria or in Lebanon. And as a result of this, this might lead to a full-scale military confrontation between Israel and Hezbollah. This is a possibility. But I would say that if it come, when it comes to Iran, Iran doesn't want that to happen. Iran wants this confrontation to, to occur only in case Israel attacks Iran. But it might evolve. Another question from the audience. 
do you believe there is a risk in allowing Iranian students, including PhD students, junior researchers, to acquire scientific knowledge in Dutch universities? Or I, I suppose you could expand this question to uh, universities yeah. outside Iran in general, sure. because yeah. is there a chance of a repeat of what happened in the early 1980s when Kadir Khan acquired nuclear knowledge in Delft? Look, uh, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that among the, the, the many Iranian students who go abroad every year, there are uh, students who work with the Iranian regime and might want to, to, to study something which might be uh, made of use by the Iranian regime. But I think that uh, this risk is much smaller than the potential uh, advantage of having uh, uh, Iranian students exposed to uh, other ideas uh, in, in the West. By the way, um, unfortunately for Iran, most of the students who leave Iran uh, do, not, do not return to Iran because the situation, economic situation in Iran is very bad. There is over 40% unemployment among uh, Iranian uh, educated uh, uh, youth. Uh, so they most of them don't want to, to, to go back. And if some of them will go back and use their scientific uh, knowledge, I would say that today the, the status of the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, uh, program is, is, is so advanced, it, it's so advanced that they don't really uh, need uh, much uh, to, act, to import from from other states. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike the nuclear uh, program of Iraq and the nuclear program of Libya and the nuclear program of, uh, of Syria, the Iranian nuclear program today is uh, much more uh, indigenous. Uh, they have their own capabilities. So even if, uh, even if they can use some uh, knowledge from the West, this is not going to, to, uh, to have a great impact. So I think I think that the, the, the bottom line is that the advantages are more uh, are, are, are bigger than the disadvantages. And that's why, uh, for example, I was totally against Trump's decision to ban the entrance of Iranian students uh, to the United States because I thought that most of them were actually uh, uh, anti-regime elements rather than uh, than potential terrorists. Uh, Russia and Iran work together in Syria as they both uh, support uh, President Assad. But how is the relationship between Russia and Iran? Well, first of all, you have to remember that the relations between Iran and Russia are, are not uh, only about Syria. I mean, Syria is one of them, uh, one of the, the issues, but uh, they have strategic uh, partnership, uh, which has to do with a lot of other issues. Uh, just recently, they reached uh, a new agreement on uh, cyber cooperation between the states. They have defense cooperation between the states. Syria is, a, is a, Syria, I would say, uh, is a little problematic. Uh, why? Because uh, on the one side, you can say that uh, both states, Russia and Iran, want to keep uh, Assad in power, and they certainly cooperated to do that. But I would say that there is also a competition between Iran and Russia or in Syria over the, the question of uh, who will enjoy more, uh, more influence, uh, especially now when the civil war is almost over. And, and from time to time, there are some reports saying that there are competitions, that there are even uh, limited, uh, uh, limited clashes between pro-Russian militias and pro-Iranian militias in different parts of, of Syria. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that this is a strategic uh, um, uh, clash between the two states, but they do not necessarily share the same uh, views concerning the future of Syria, uh, and certainly not uh, not concerning the question who will be uh, who will enjoy um, the, the fruits uh, from from Assad's uh, stay in, in, in the uh, in power. I would say that all those who, who, who think, and unfortunately there are some people even in Israel who think that the Russians are going to uh, to pull the Iranians out of Syria. Again, uh, talking about wishful thinking, this is wishful thinking. I think that that even if there are some competitions between them, and even if the the, the Russians don't want don't see uh, exactly the same objectives in Syria as the Iranians, they will certainly uh, don't want. They, they they will probably not do anything. To, uh, to entirely pull, uh, pull, pull Iran out of that. Are there threats for Iran on their eastern borders? 
and also what are the relations between Iran and Pakistan? Uh, I wouldn't say threats. I would say that the eastern front, the eastern border between Iran and Pakistan, uh, is uh, is uh, is very sensitive, uh, mainly because of two issues. One is the issue of uh, of uh, drug uh, traffic between the states, and the se the second thing, which is more security oriented threat, is the activity of uh, Baluchi. Uh, dissidents, uh, Baluchi uh, separatist organization in the border between Iran and uh, and Pakistan. This is an ongoing uh, problem between the two states, and uh, Iran has uh, blamed Pakistan again and again for its support for the Baluchi separatist work in Iran. Uh, of course, uh, Iran does, doesn't doesn't like the situation of being uh, near a nuclear uh, nuclear power like Pakistan. Uh, but I wouldn't say that this is a um, this is a, a high priority uh, in most time. Uh, and sometimes there are some problems, especially after uh, attacks carried out by the Baluchis against the IRGC uh, posts near the border between the two states. Uh, and the last question: What is the military situation of Saudi Arabia towards Iran, and could Saudi Arabia? also become a nuclear power in response to Iran? Well, I have, uh, I have, to, uh, I have enough problems with Iran before I, I, <laughs> I, I uh, deal with Saudi Arabia. I, I would say that uh, militarily, the problem is that uh, despite, despite the, the enormous uh, military capabilities the Saudis enjoy, mainly due to US uh, support, uh, the Saudis uh, would not like to get to be engaged in a full-scale confrontation with Iran. Because Iran has uh, other advantages, for example, their uh, subversive uh, potential activity against, uh, against Saudi Arabia, especially when it comes to the, the Shia minority in Eastern uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, so the bottom line is the Saudi Arabia, despite all its uh, capabilities, uh, they certainly don't want uh, to uh, become engaged in uh, in a military confrontation with Iran. And, uh, uh, and we had a very good example for that after the Iranian attack on the Aramco ins uh, installations in Saudi Arabia in September 2019, when uh, Saudi Arabia did nothing to retaliate. They hoped Trump would do something, but Trump did nothing. I mean, he did, he, he tweeted, but uh, tweets is not the, 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 the way to deal with, uh, with this issue. So I think that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and that of course explains uh, uh, at least partially the, the uh, growing uh, um, contacts between Saudi Arabia and Israel, because uh, Saudi Arabia might might uh, consider Israel as a as, an, as a possible uh, ally in its uh, confrontation with Iran. But I'm not sure that uh, we, we could count on Saudi Arabia to do that. Uh, I mean, in the end, Saudi Arabia knows uh, its uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, it knows the Iranian uh, um, capabilities as well. So it might try to cooperate either with the United States or if Biden changes his policy towards Saudi Arabia, perhaps with Israel against Iran. But I think that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, in the near future, especially if the United States is going to, to reconsider its policy towards Saudi Arabia, we might see uh, attempts by the Saudis to, um, uh, to become more engaged in uh, diplomatic efforts with Iran, uh, recognizing the new situation right now uh, after the new administration in, in the White House. I have one final question from the audience. Um, about uh, inside Iran itself. How about exploring the minorities inside Iran, uh, such as the Azeris, the Kurds, and the Arabs? Well, uh, unfortunately, I have to say, this is a question which comes up uh, again and again. I, 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 I think the minority question in Iran is sometimes uh, over, uh, overrated. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because uh, yes, the, the, the ethnic minorities in Iran are uh, consist of uh, almost half, almost 50% of the population in Iran. But you have to remember that uh, there are many differences between the ethnic, uh, the, the ethnic groups in, in Iran. For example, when you speak about the Arabs, 
the Arab minority in uh, in Western Iran, uh, most of them are Shiite. Uh, so uh, so they are not Sunnis. They 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 don't they don't want. Yes, there is separatist uh, movement among the Arabs in uh, uh, in Saudi or in uh, in Western Iran. The Hawazi movement. Uh, some some few might know it uh, because of its activity in the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure it represents the majority of the Arab population inside inside Iran. And then you have the Azeris, uh, who consist of um, 15 or 20 percent of the Iranian population, but they are actually quite. Uh, uh, they, they, are, they don't. They usually are quite. Uh, um, they don't have any problems with with the regime. Khamenei himself is half Azeri. So yes, there are some uh, sensitivity concerning the Azeris in Iran, especially after the recent uh, confrontation between Armenia and Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, where we, we can see uh, those demonstrations in uh, northern Iran uh, in favor of Azerbaijan. But uh, it's not that the Azeri wants to separate themselves from, from Iran. And there are the Kurds and there are the Baluchis. So there is no real connection between the different ethnic minorities. And I would say that the, the majority of the ethnic um, uh, groups in Iran are not after separation from Iran. Uh, most of them are not even uh, in favor of uh, autonomy. They just want to improve uh, their position, their economic position. They want to remove uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, restrictive uh, policies uh, against them. For example, the, the, the use of, uh, they want to use their own languages in schools in the areas. But uh, I think that all those who, who really think that the change is uh, going to happen, to, to occur uh, by the ethnic minorities, again, uh, I, I wouldn't count on it. I, and I think it's, it's actually sometimes counterproductive because uh, the majority of the, of the Iranian population, mostly of course the Persians, but not just, are very sensitive to any kind of use of this ethnic card. Uh, and they are very concerned with the possibility of um, of uh, damaging and harming the the territorial uh, the territorial uh, uh, unity uh, of, of 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 Iran. So usually, when you see West Western countries or Saudi Arabia supporting uh, ethnic minorities in Iran, it actually uh, has the, the opposite uh, the opposite uh, result because. Um, because it, it actually makes the, the most Iranian, especially the, the Persian majority, uh, even more, uh, I would say, rally around the flag, around the regime, because they, the last thing they want to do, want to see, is, the, is, is, the, is Iran to, to separate um, between the ethnic minorities. We, we have to remember that Iran is not like the Arab, the Arab states or some of the Arab states. Uh, Iran has kept its uh, borders uh, most. Uh, most borders uh, did not change since the 16th century. Uh, so there is something which is called the Iranian uh, national uh, uh, Iranian national identity, uh, despite the differences between ethnic minorities. Uh, I, 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 I think we should be very careful not to use the ethnic issue too, too much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rassimt, for taking the time to speak with us. Dank aan uh, alle kijkers uh, thuis, ook voor, voor het kijken, maar ook voor het stellen van de vragen. Uh, wilt u deze lezingen steunen? Dat kan op verschillende manieren. Dat kunt u vinden op www.cd.nl. Deze en andere lezingen kunt u ook terugkijken uh, op de verschillende CD-kanalen, waaronder op YouTube, op het YouTube-kanaal CD-TV. Volgende week voor de informatiereeks hebben we Dr. Jonathan Spire, van de, uh, hij zal spreken over strategische ontwikkelingen in het Midden-Oosten. Dat is dus op woensdagochtend 3 maart. En nogmaals dank en een fijne dag. Have a good day. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope to see you soon in person, not just uh, through Zoom.